So, the lesson tonight will be, Our Savior Understands Temptation. And we'll get even a better look at that in chapter 4. Father, we thank you for your word. We just pray it will touch our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Last week, we talked on verses 5 through 9. Which means, of course, that uh, the first lesson in chapter 2, the second lesson overall with the first four verses of this chapter, and the next five were last week, and then uh, uh, the the last nine are going to be covered this uh, morning, or evening. This is evening, right? This evening. Um, So, in review, again, a little lower than the angels was the title last week, verse 5. For unto the angels he has not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. So I made a note, Paul is going to show his readers that the gospel or the new covenant is greater than the law or the old covenant because Jesus is greater than the angels. Again, this is known as the greater than epistle. And uh, right now, the author who many believe to be Paul. If it's not Paul, I believe it's either Paul or one of his, for a lack of a better word, disciples, one of those who learned at uh, by listening to Paul. They understood the gospel by sitting around listening to Paul, traveling with him maybe in his uh, uh, missionary journeys. So uh, could have been Timothy. Again, it could have been his doctor, Luke. Luke wrote the gospel, Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. And so he was um, somebody the Holy Spirit used to write. Luke could have wrote this book. But whoever wrote it, in my mind, if it wasn't Paul, it was somebody whose doctrine was Pauline. Now, we taught through First and Second Peter just recently here, and tremendous things to say. Peter presents the gospel, the same gospel he presented differently. James presents the same gospel differently. Paul presents the gospel one way, and whoever wrote this book presents it Paul's way. And uh, that's why I believe it's either Paul um, or one of his uh, fellow workers, co-workers. So uh, we, we'll, we'll know when we get to heaven. We're going to get to heaven. We've got to have a list. Sometimes Barb has to take a list to the doctor so she remembers to ask the doctor everything she wants. We're going to need to go to heaven. When the trumpet sounds, I'm going to say, Wait, Lord, i got to get my... <laughs> but anyway, i um, got to get my list. I want to know if Philemon did right by Onesimus. And I want to know who wrote this uh, book. But uh, we'll, get, we'll worry about that when we get to heaven. Will, will we know all things, though, Pastor Anna? What? We have a mind of Christ, right? Yeah. yeah. When, when, if we get taken up, well, I mean, not when. Yeah. But before, we, you know, if we go right now, then we won't have the mind of Christ. We'll, have, we'll be glorified on the way up. Yeah. The Bible teaches. Um, but and when, for, we and, die, and we will, when we die, we will not have a glorified. We will on the way up. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, the body we ain't... We will have a glorified body, but we will have a mind like Christ. Right. We will be glorified, and we'll come back with Him and get the glorified body when the dead in Christ rise. Oh, okay. Uh, so but we, we will... have the glorified we'll, mind. And right. I mean, we'll no, never struggle. As soon as we dump this body as believers... Our struggles will be over. Because sin dwells in the members of this body. Adam passed sin onto the entire human family through human bodies. Because he was the first human, his DNA passed through the next generation, and that generation's DNA passed through the next generation. So Romans 5 teaches that sin and death came from Adam. And all have sinned. Now, there's two meanings to that. Because everybody is a descendant of Adam, then all mankind or all humanity within Adam when he sinned. And so, therefore, we sinned before we were ever born in the sense that we were in the bowels of Adam. 
But then, secondly, we've all sinned personally since we've been born. So uh, we are sinners twice, once by birth and once by action. And uh, so we need the Lord Jesus to come into our heart. But uh, when we see Jesus, 1 John 3, verse 2, we will be like him. How come? For we shall see him as he is. When the blinders are removed, now we see Jesus in the Word, but the reason we're not glorified as we study about Jesus in His, in his Word is because 1 Corinthians 13 says, For now we see through the glass darkly. We don't have full revelation of Jesus yet. Are you, and, are you saying my puny little mind of being in special education yeah. can't grasp like I try to read this pertaining it, I know the word God says that a natural mind can understand the things of the spirit. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, we're not going to do a question and answer tonight because then I'll never get through that. Uh, so just let me say um, that uh, you, when we go to heaven, you'll be every bit as glorified as Daryl, every bit as glorified as me. Your mind will work every bit as good as Daryl's mind, um, every bit as good as my mind it'll work as good as the mind of Almighty God in some ways. Now, God still will have one thing over us. His mind will be infinite. Uh, But our mind will be patterned after His mind. There will be no deficiencies, what we call birth defects or anything else in heaven. None. We will all be glorified. And you will be no less glorified than Billy Graham. Uh, We're all going to be glorified. So... His work in you will be as total as His work in Paul the Apostle. Uh, There will be no second place in heaven. You are going to be 100% totally glorified. That's the good news. So he talked about uh, what he's talking about in a little lower than the angels. Last week's lesson is the fact that, uh, again, the gospel is greater than... um, the law of Moses, verse 6, but in a certain place, but one in a certain place, talking about David, the psalmist, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? All those people are uniquely peculiar. Now, we're all peculiar in Christ. Um, The word peculiar there, when it describes God's children as peculiar, we're uniquely different than the unsaved. But we all have, just comparing one person to the next, we all have some peculiar things about us. I was telling a guy at work today, uh, I could come across to there again. Um, there are times, <laughs> there are times people could think that I think I know everything. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Um, I do think when you get into Scripture, I do think God has graced me with an understanding for whatever reason. I don't understand it because I have so few people to talk to. But I do believe He's given me an ability, God-given ability to understand Scripture. But I told this guy, I said, I don't hardly like myself most of the time. So sometimes people would look at me from the outside and think I'm arrogant. I think, God, what in the world are you doing saving me? I don't get it. Um, So when I read this verse by another David, the psalmist David, what is man, Psalm 44, 22, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visits him? It almost makes me cry when I read it because I can't understand. There are times I, I thank God you've given me certain abilities and I've wasted them. I, somehow I haven't done anything uh, to get the word out there to a, a group of any size. And uh, there's parables about if he gives you one talent and you bury it. Uh, um, if some he gave ten uh, Talents and they invested and reaped ten more and five and they invested and reaped five more. And there are times I think I'm that one there. 
And uh, there are times I have to walk myself back through the gospel to encourage myself. I'm a cup half empty guy. I naturally don't like myself much. And because I don't like myself, it makes me like other people a whole lot more sometimes because I don't think I'm better than anybody. Now again, because of my personality, some people would misjudge me and think I'm arrogant. I am anything but arrogant. I am overcome by the mercy of Almighty God. I keep thinking, God, if I were you, I wouldn't have saved me for crying out loud. Uh, so I'm glad I'm not you. So I, that's why I write songs like, He loved me when I lived in sin. He beckoned me, I ran from Him. I don't deserve the grace He's given me. To think that God would call again. David said, What is man? that you were mindful of him. And again, until I came to him, are the son of man that thou visits him. David went through some of that. One of the most famous people in the scripture went through some of the stuff, must be the name, that I find myself going through. I'm not real happy with myself a lot of times. Um, but I tell you, I'm plenty happy with what God is, uh, has done for me. He saved this miserable piece of humanity. And uh, he's going to glorify me one day. And I'm, he's already justified me. And so I'm head over heels in love with him. So that's the good news. But he's, uh, Dave, he's alluding, last week in the actual lesson I had the passage in Psalms, but it's from the verses uh, uh, in verse 6 that uh, the Hebrew author is referring to is Psalm 44.22. Or Psalm twenty two forty four. One of those two. I think it's forty four twenty two. But uh, anyway, that's where David said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Son of man that thou visitest him. And he goes on and says, Thou hast made him, mankind, a little lower than the angels. Um, so the author is saying here, um, and he goes on there in verse 7, Thou hast made him, who? Man, the, the one you're mindful of. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hand. God put Adam and Eve in the garden and said, Have dominion over it. They represented all the coming of humanity. And he gave them dominion over all of creation. And so we talked about last week. So God, when he said he's given him dominion over everything, means they're he hasn't left anything in creation that he hasn't given them dominion over. And yet, the writer of Hebrews said, we don't see that. We don't see man totally in dominion of everything. If man was living up to his rightful place the way God created him, we'd know how to control storms. We would know how to control everything on this planet. But we don't see it. But he said, we don't see it yet, but we see Jesus. Now, why did he say that? Because there's the man who was made a little lower than the angels that will exercise dominion over all creation. And you and I will ride his coattails in the heaven, and we will observe the dominion he exercises in and through us. What a day that will be. Let's jump ahead now to today's lesson. Our Savior understands temptation. Again, we're going to touch on that today. Next week, I mean not next week, when we get to chapter 4, it's got some amazing things to say on this very, if I remember on this very important point, Jesus uh, understands temptation. If I remember, I'll when I'm on those areas of chapter 4, I'll say, our Savior understands temptation part two because we'll be continuing that thought but anyway if, if i might call it something else when i get there forgetting all about what i just said verse 10 for it becomes him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons on to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering now, who's the him there? God Almighty. 
So it became God. It becomes God. It was something God would do to fulfill His goals. It became Him whom, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. God the Father and God the Son for that matter. But right now we're looking at God the Father because God the Son is playing a different role in this scenario. And so, for God to save humanity, or that portion of humanity that would come to Him, He had to cause Jesus to be made a little lower than the angels, just like you and I were. Jesus had to enter the world as a human. And it said that He would make the captain of their salvation, Jesus, God the Father, would make Jesus perfect through sufferings. Now, when you first read that, what does that mean? Jesus was always perfect. There's never been a moment in eternity forward, or there'll never be a moment in, I mean, uh, there's never been a moment in, in eternity backwards, and there'll never be a moment in eternity forward when Jesus wasn't and won't be perfect. He has been perfect forever that way, and He'll be perfect forever that way. So what's this verse talking about? He doesn't have to be made perfect. He, by being God, is, has always been, and will always be perfect. So, what what is uh, the author telling us when he said, in essence, God is making the captain of our salvation, who is Jesus, perfect through his suffering. This is where commentators are of such benefit. You you can look at people who have studied the Word forever. They understand the Greek involved here. And you'll get different ideas. Uh, I heard somebody one time say, well, he's always been perfect in the sense of sinlessness. But there's something he learned through suffering. He never, as God, experienced experienced pain. He created man, and man is vulnerable to pain. But God Himself had never personally experienced pain or suffering. So, God was in Christ, reconciling in in 2 Corinthians 5. God, talking here, God the Father was in Christ, and Jesus received the Spirit without measure, meaning God the Holy Spirit within Him. So the triune God was in this one human person called Jesus. None of them had ever physically felt pain. Their creations, whether animal or human, have all felt pain. So Jesus, not that God didn't understand it, He created this universe. But He didn't understand it by feeling it. And suddenly, Jesus is being beaten with a cat of twelve tails or nine tails, depending which commentary you read. That's a whip that has nine to twelve strands on the end of it, each of them having a jagged piece of metal or jagged rock tied into it. So every time that whip hits you one time, it's tearing nine to twelve pieces of skin out of your body. God stood there and let them do that to him. For me. For me, a guy who doesn't even like himself much. He must like me plenty. Thirty-nine times it was against Jewish law to whip a man forty times because some would die. So they had a limit of whip. We could only beat you thirty-nine times. But if every thirty-nine times you're either having nine or twelve pieces of skin ripped out of your body, that's over four hundred pieces of skin whipped out. And he stood there 
when he could have called 10,000 angels. He was learning something about you and me experientially, something he always knew here. But now he learned it experientially what pain was. And boy, did he learn it. So some suggest that's just talking about he took on a new awareness of humanity. But that would be to suggest that God's knowledge was somehow limited. And most of us have difficulty believing that there were any limitations to God's knowledge. So I agree more with the commentators who tell us what the word perfect means in the Greek. We always want to relate perfect to sinlessness. It means completion. It means there are some flowers that only bloom once a year. I don't know what they are. I don't pay that much attention, but I've seen shows uh, on movies on TV where there was that flower. And everybody wants to gather around. This is the night it's going to do it. And then Dennis the Menace shows up and ruins everything. Yeah, I heard that. But anyway, that uh, when that flower blooms, it's perfect. What that means is it has reached its final glory. It has reached the apex of which it was created for. It has blossomed. So Jesus, who was always, He was never created in the sense that you and I are. Yet, the Creator became created in the sense that He decided to visit humanity. And so He was born of the Virgin Mary and took on a human body that is perishable. Every human body but His. When He died, God did not allow it to suffer corruption, the Bible says. So there are times we will see Jesus in heaven. He will look exactly like He looked when He rose from the dead. And then there are other times God will open our eyes and see the the glory of Jesus. But... His body is still the body He was crucified in. Your body will corrupt. We witnessed Barb's half-sister's body when she had been dead about three days. Was that what it was? About three days. And it was already starting to discolor. They were going to cremate, so they didn't do anything to preserve her like... uh, uh, Oh, my mind's going blank. When they drain the blood and put the fluids in, what is it? Embalm. Embalm. Yeah, they didn't do anything like embalmer because uh, they were going to cremate as soon as uh, those who were coming got up there and looked at her and beheld her. And uh, But Jesus' body was not decaying at all. God would not suffer. His body, His clay, His flesh, had a blessing that no other flesh ever had. God lives in it. This flesh can corrupt. uh, My flesh isn't waiting for me to get dead to corrupt. (laughs) It's getting older and older all the time. I tell you what. um, So it's, uh, hey, I'm still living here. But uh, anyway, it's decaying. But uh, that's what we do. We get older and... uh, we decay some, and then we die, and we go into uh, decay. And so if we're going to be buried, uh, they embalm us. If not, uh, they um, burn us. Good news for Christian: that's the only burning you'll ever go through, and you won't feel nothing because you will already be with Jesus. So um, the captain of our salvation learned something through suffering. Some commentators say, that he hadn't personally experienced before. Others say um, he just reached his apex of what God put him on the planet to do, and that was die for mankind to carry our sins away. So um, I believe that's the way we should understand that. Verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth 
God Almighty, and they which are sanctified, Jesus as the human, the human part of Jesus, and all Christians are all of one, for which cause he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. Good news, Bible. He purifies people from their sins. And both he, Jesus, and those who are made pure, all have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his family. Isn't that neat? The Son of Almighty God. There's nothing made that wasn't made by him, John wrote. He was an integral part of creation. Jesus, I tell you, we all think we're something if we get a bigger paycheck than the guy down the street. Jesus is God. And He's going to be proud one day in heaven to call me His brother. Wow. Is that amazing or what? Flip the thing over if you would. So what does Jesus do absolutely free of shame? He's going to call you and me as brothers and sisters. Yet, oh, I, got, I printed that wrong. I printed Psalm 22. 22. Or maybe I'm right. I, I thought it was 44, 22. Uh, but whatever. It's one of those things. So um, that's in verse 12. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? That's from a messianic psalm. Uh, and uh, that could be right. Or 44 could be one of those. Um, either the chapter or the verse. Um, but maybe it is 22, 22. Because I'm usually pretty careful when I uh, print that stuff down. So. There in the Old Testament psalm, there was no such thing as a church. So when David wrote it, it was, it's called a Messianic psalm, David got under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and was in essence prophesying about Jesus. Not all of his songs. Some of his songs are just songs of worship and praise. Some are songs of confusion where by the end of the psalm, God brings them to understanding some issues going on in his life. But there are psalms that we call messianic psalms because he's referring to Jesus. And since there's no church in the Old Testament, in psalm it doesn't say church, it says congregation. So uh, in the New Testament he says, Behold, I and the children which God has given me Oh, no, which one? I? Where was I? Oh, verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. In Psalm, it said, in the midst of the congregation. But that is a quotation of the Messianic Psalm of David, Psalm 22. Verse 13. Again, the Holy Spirit is inspiring this author. To let us know that God is not ashamed, Jesus is not ashamed to call Amber his sister, to call you and I his brother. God himself, Jesus Christ, will call you brother proudly. On the one hand you think, wow, on the other hand, why wouldn't he? He's the one who bled to make you pure. He's the one who paid the penalty to make you clean in God's presence. So he should be proud. Not proud of us. Proud of the work that he accomplished for the Father in the purifying of the saints. Verse um, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, all those of us that are getting saved have bodies with blood in them. So we're partakers of flesh and blood. He, Jesus, also himself, likewise, took part of the same. So Jesus had to be born into the human family. So he had flesh and blood so that he could bleed 
Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, the Bible teaches. And so Jesus had to bleed blood in His sufferings to wash my sins away. So He had to become like me, having flesh and blood, that through death He might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. He broke the devil's hold on you and me. Now, there are days when you're not happy with yourself and you think the devil's still got too strong a foothold in your life. The devil does, has no foothold in your life. Zero. Jesus has broken you free of his control. You now sin only when you choose to. Because sin dwells in your members. The devil cannot make you sin. He can make some sinners sin, unbelievers. You sin because you choose to. So stop it! All right. The power of Satan has been broken in your life, but you will struggle with the principle of sin until you shed your physical body that you currently have and have it replaced by a glorified body. So he had to become man so he could, as a man, die for our sins. And uh, by doing that, he, de he, um, he destroyed him that had the, the power of death, that is the devil. Now, please note in 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the sin, devil rather, sins from the beginning. For the purpose, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, John is writing in his first epistle what the author of Hebrews is writing here, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And not only that, verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, what causes the fear of death? Why are we afraid to die? Well, if you ask most people, it's because it's the unknown. The fear of the unknown. But there's more to it than that. The, the Bible actually gives us a reason why we are fearful of death. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians, the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians early in the chapter tells us if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus is not raised. And if Jesus is not raised, then our faith is vain. So Paul writing to the Corinthians said you can't se separate the resurrection of Jesus by the truth of the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. You can't have one without the other. If Jesus rose from the dead, all God's children are going to raise from the dead. And that's what uh, some of the wonderful stuff this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians teaches us. But here, wait in the chapter... I read this sometimes at a graveside. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? In other words, where is your finality, death? This person is dead, death. But it isn't ending here. That's God's child and your death didn't end anything. So, grave, where is your victory? And then he says in verse 56, the sting of death. Here's, boy, I tell you, there's so much doctrine in verse 15. In so little time right now. So I'm just going to hit on the highlight of it. The sting of death is sin. The sting of death. He said in the verse above there, O oh, death, where is your sting? And in the next verse he says, here's what makes death sting. Sin. We're afraid to die because we don't know if God is as compassionate as they say He is. So we dread this idea of standing before this judge, this perfect judge who will sentence us to an eternal of glory, eternity of glory, or to suffering forever. 
And we think, were we good enough because we keep getting this law thing messing up our head? Were we good enough? The guy I take breaks with at work it just drives me crazy. I want to take them and shake them. You can't have it both ways. You're either saved or you're not. You're not saved, and then because you had a bad thought, not saved. Because then you're not going to heaven by the grace of God. You're going by to heaven by the luck of the draw. When you die, you might as well go to Vegas. you got better odds there. I just... He said, so you don't think i got to do anything? I think, yeah, you got to give your heart to Jesus. And I say, so you're telling me that the sacrifice of Christ for your sins was insufficient. you got to finish the job. He said, well, you do it your way. I'm going to try to be real good. All right, you try to be real good. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to feel better on my deathbed than he is. Because I understand that I'm not saved by what I've done. I'm saved by what Jesus did. And there's nothing wrong with what he did. Amen? So the sting of death is sin. Now look at the last part of that. The strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. Romans 7. Romans 7 said, I was alive without the law once. But the commandment came, sin revived and I died. For sin took occasion of the commandment and wrought all manner of evil desires in me. The commandment comes around from the law of Moses and said, Don't you dare do that. And then sin jumps on that opportunity and said, I wonder why God doesn't want you to do that. Just like he did with Eve. Has God told you you can't eat of any of the fruit of these trees? No, no, no. He just told us we couldn't eat of the fruit of that tree there. And if we did, we'd die. Oh, you won't surely die. He just doesn't want you to eat it. This is exactly how the conversation went. He just doesn't want you to eat it because the moment you'll eat it, you'll become like him, knowing right from wrong or good from evil in the uh, Genesis account. Sin took occasion of the commandment. God, just jealous. He doesn't want you to have a good time. So we think if we just keep piling on the rules, the law, law of Moses is enough, so let's as the church write a bunch of laws. We've been in churches that had all kinds of rules. You can participate in the any ministry in the church, if you go to movies, if you play cards, if you dance, all these other rules that aren't in Moses' law. Moses' laws weren't enough. Come on, pile some more on there. Things that the Bible doesn't teach at all. The problem with rules is they incite sin. The strength of sin is the law. The more law you have, the more sin there is that takes place. And then you sin all the more because you can't control the lust that is created by the commandment that forbids something. So the sin becomes greater, so there is a sting of death. Because when you're trusting your actions instead of His actions to get you to heaven... You're never quite sure if you're ready to die. But I tell you, when we get this thing figured out that it's all Jesus and none of me, salvation is faith, as Martin Luther said, faith plus nothing. Let me say it again. Salvation in Jesus comes from faith plus nothing. Trusting Jesus in Him alone not an action of yours whatsoever. And when you get truly saved, guess what? You start living a better life. Because you're in love with the Savior. Same reason, I tell you, I think um, I'd walk a mile for that woman. (laughs) 
I drive too. <laughs> but but I, I tell you, I would do just about anything for that woman. I honestly believe. I hope I never have to find out, but I honestly believe I take a bullet for it. I think I jump in front of the gun for that woman. I really do. Uh, when you love somebody, it affects how you live. We as Christians live right, not because we're living under a deluge of laws, but because we're in love with Jesus. We're in love with Jesus. All right, real quickly, the last, uh, verse 16. For verily he took on him not the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, what did he do that? He was made, what's that mean? He goes back to he was made a little lower than the angels. Verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So when he stepped into the role, not of a, uh, the high priest of the law of Moses, but the high priest of the gospel, when the law was changed on the night Jesus was betrayed to make it legal for Jesus, who was not a descendant of Aaron, to become the high priest, he stepped into humanity because it gave him a new... It's hard to look at perfection and word these things in a way that makes sense to us. But the perfect Creator became personally aware of temptation. And so he has compassion on his people. He was tempted, the Bible says, in every area like we are. Any kind of temptation any Christian's ever faced, Jesus faced. The difference is, he never yielded. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet he was without sin. But the temptations were real. In flesh and blood, the Father allowed Jesus to feel what people feel when they're tempted, knowing that Jesus would never yield. But he felt it. Why? So he could be a merciful priest for us. He understands things about us. You know the old thing saying, until you walked a mile in my shoes? Jesus walked 33 years in our shoes. Facing everything anyone's ever faced. So that he could have compassion on us in the role of priest. Finally, verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. Or the easy to read verse in. And now he can help those who are tempted. He's able to help because he himself suffered and was tempted. Make no mistake about it. God the Father allowed his perfect Son to fill the draw of temptation. So though, even though there was no possibility Jesus would ever yield to that draw, because by nature he is perfect, he still felt that. So when you're being drawn by temptation, he understands. The difference is there was no sin dwelling in the members of his body like there is sin dwelling in the members of ours. So temptation impacts us differently than it impacted Jesus. But God allowed Jesus to be made a little lower than the angels so he could walk 33 years in our shoes and be our compassionate high priest.